Hey, this is Annie. And Samantha. And welcome to Stuff I Never Told You, a production of iHeartRadio. And welcome back to our girl who has uh, been doing what she needs to do for the state of Georgia, but she didn't want to and I didn't want her to go, but she's back. Annie, welcome back. Thank you. And thank you for covering beautifully for me while I was gone. The surprise jury duty, right? <laughs> I have to say. Uh, you and Christina and Caroline, thank you to all of you for allowing me to do my civic duty. Allowing, like like anybody had a choice. <laughs> well, we're glad you're back. We've missed you greatly. It is holiday time. And as much as we're like, we're going to get back on regular schedule. Probably not. Probably not. Thanksgiving is coming. Christmas is coming. New Year's is coming. Sicknesses has happened. <sighs> Emergency situations happening. Elections are happening. So we're not, we're not going to test those waters quite yet. But for this week, we're trying to come back on schedule. We'll see how that goes. Who knows? And that includes our Monday Mini, which we are recording today as it's being published. So if you're wondering, it is October 14th, 2024. Um, and I thought we would do something super simple to ease us back in for me and you because it's been a heavy couple of months, <laughs> whether it's sicknesses or vacations or birthdays or jury duty. So with that, I thought we would just uh, do a quick rundown of one of my favorite things and the almost only thing that I watch, except I happen to be watching a few of the classics. Supernatural has popped back into my rotation, but we're talking K-dramas. K-dramas. And I keep going back to the fact that Dean in Supernatural has a really big Asian fetish. And I'm like, huh, this would not go over well today. But it's a whole thing. But anyway, that whole... Did we ever say... In, in in Supernatural, when that publication, Busty Asian Beauties, is that <laughs> a real publication? I doubt it because they'd okay. have to get legal. I'm sure there's something that they based it on. Similar of. to? Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. hmm. Anyway, coming back to what I love, which is K-dramas. And I thought we'd do a quick review of things I've watched and things Annie has been watching. Because, you know, she's global when it comes to horror movie times. We we do the she does the global level of watching all the movies. Uh, you were just talking about one now. I was like, oh yeah, I don't even think I realized because I don't watch a lot of movies anymore. I used to watch only movies, and it would always be action movies, really sad action movies. But I've come back to doing dramas because I like them longer. You know, giving me some time to uh, fall in love or really hate a character. Mm -hmm. I just love good that. So I thought we would do that today, <laughs> and yeah. I think we're going to start off with some movies because we talked a little bit about it before. Um, one of the movies we talked about was Exuma, which if you don't know, it is a horror movie that really made its rounds. I think people were kind of shocked by the fact that even though it's very Korean cultural basis, like it's very based on their cultural beliefs and or superstitions, which, you know, usually makes the best movies. People really got into it and really got into the fact that they're like, oh, these are kind of based on real rituals. And if you're not careful, uh, this can get you. <laughs> yeah. And that kind of was part of like the scariness of it. Like, like if you concentrate too hard, try to listen to too hard into their like ceremonies, you might catch a bad spirit. Mm -hmm. Did you feel that or is that just me? No, I did. Um, and it's, I say this with all the love of my heart because it's completely true. But I have a friend, a mutual friend of ours who texted me and was like, yeah. I found this new horror movie and he said it was Exum. And I was like, no, I've seen it. Um, <laughs> <laughs> you behind yep. the times, my friend. Uh, but he was yeah, like, it feels like... kind of like, he said something like it felt kind of like Ghostbusters with the Blair Witch Project, but with like real stuff in there. <laughs> like actual could get you in trouble stuff. And I was like, yeah. I'm yeah, intrigued okay. by the Ghostbusters part. Is it because there's ghosts? Like, I think it was because they were kind of like, yeah, they're busting. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Fair enough, fair enough. Because when I think Ghostbusters, I'm thinking that it's like more of a comedy. Right. And Exuma was not a comedy. No. I think he just meant like it felt like they had this 
we're going to get rid of this thing. Yeah, okay. And that, But it does take, like, the third act takes a real turn. It For does. me, it did. <laughs> it does. It, there's a whole lot of things. And if you don't know, uh, so Ko Eun Kim is one of the main characters, as well as Do Hyun Lee, uh, who are two huge uh, younger K-drama actors. But then you have Choi Min Sik, who is huge. Like, he did Old Boy. Like, if you've known any... Korean classics, he's the one. He's the one you've seen. Again, I think Old Boy is the big, big one crossover that everybody's like, oh, this is gangster type of like Korean movies. Yes, he is that dude. He's always been that dude. And he still maintains to be that dude as, again, he was in this film and really like brought on some different level of um, theatrics to anything spooky or action. And it's no spoilers, I'm not going to tell you everything about it, but essentially, it's, it's the dead haunting you. And what does that mean, especially when it comes to ancestral levels of haunting, as well as bad players. And if you know anything about Korean history, then you understand that when it comes to the Japanese occupation, there's a lot of hate and a lot of divisive conversation, rightly so. And there's still, like, this level of tension in this conversation because... The Japanese government, and I'm not going to say the Japanese people necessarily, but the Japanese government still refuse to acknowledge their complete wrongdoing. And like, not necessarily the war part, because war sh- happens, and that in itself is gross. And there's so many things in that conversation, especially when you're talking about colonialization and conquering other countries, whatever, whatnot. Uh, but when it comes down to um, some of the atrocities that happen within that wartime, that still has not been really discussed and or acknowledged to the full extent by the Japanese government. We know when it comes to war, when it, we know when it comes to, like, colonialization as well as trying to conquer somebody, taking over a country. Not a lot of countries will take <laughs> accountability. So with that, Exuma does play into this level as well, but also along the lines of their Buddhist traditions, like rituals and all of these things, as well as their own beliefs, um, again, and superstitions that follow along. So really, really intense level. The amazing fan cuts I've seen about this movie, which have all been Western people who've done it, which, okay, cool. Uh, Again, this is where we've talked about before about the K-Wave and how big it is and how like movies like this actually do speak to all genders more so uh, because it's not K-drama drama, if that makes sense. It is an action, scary horror movie, and they're like, oh yeah, I can get down with this, kind of like old boy. And they really, really made headway with this level of horror and superstition slash action thriller movie because it was different. I think that's one of the things that I enjoyed about this movie is that is unfamiliar. Like, we, we've we seen a lot of, well, I guess, being in the U.S., we know a lot of U.S.-centric superstitions that we've seen. Uh, we've talked a lot about, like, the cultural, international levels of superstition, especially when it comes to, like, women, women's spirits and spirits. So seeing a little different take onto this with a different historical context that, that we don't necessarily, we being, again, U.S.-centric, Western-centric um, culture, it was nice as well as a reprieve, I guess, from what we normally see. So kind of like uh, Blair Witch, you know, like it was new for its concept, but still like the legends were more similar, hiding in the woods. Because I grew up trying to find the haunted area in the woods because I I was raised in the woods, essentially. (laughs) (laughs) Mm -hmm. I did too. I mean, you were. But yeah, so it was really nice to see. This is completely different. It talks a lot about its culture. Talks, again, like they tried their best to honor their rituals and practices by making sure they brought in Korean shamans who directed them, taught them how to protect themselves as well as how to do things correctly, the ceremonies. And like if you really come in, because I feel like especially when we talk about Asian cultures, people come in with like a closed mind, making fun of something because it's not familiar to them. But it, yeah, people who come in and understanding how serious these rituals are, these chants, these songs, all of these, that, that they can't, like they really truly believe that this can cause you problems spiritually and physically and emotionally, that you take that seriousness in watching this movie, that it will give you that kind of uh, moment. Yeah. It's really, like you said, I thought it was um, 
It was unlike most stuff I've seen, which I've seen a lot of horror movies, so that's that's impressive. <laughs> and I recommend it. Yeah, it's it's really fun, and it it's like it does have a lot of changes where you think, oh, it's going this way. Oh, it's going this way. Oh, it's going this way. Yeah. But with that kind of the history and those superstitions that are really interesting and all of that built into it, so I really enjoyed it. That that poor priest. Yeah. Anyway, without spoilers, just y'all, that poor priest. Uh, <laughs> Generally. But good things. <laughs> anyway, but yes, this is an Annie and Sam recommendation. If you love a good horror movie, if you have time to sit down and read the subtitles, I think you should definitely watch it in Korean. I don't recommend dubbed for this because you're going to miss... I don't know if you'll miss it because I don't know how they will do like the whole chanting seat part. Surely they wouldn't dub that over, but you should definitely watch uh, if you love a good horror movie. Something else that I watched that's not a horror movie, if you don't want to go down the road, is Love Reset. I actually watched this on our way to D.C., uh, I was like, yeah, look at this. I guess the Korean dramas, they're following me because they recommended <laughs> this movie to me on a flight. I don't understand this, but okay. And it's a Korean drama with one of my favorite, favorite, favorite actresses, Jung So Min. I've talked about her previously a lot, uh, who I think is just an adorable, wonderful actress. And it's an actual romantic comedy. And because I'm so used to K-dramas, I wasn't expecting, like, they don't have, like, gratuitous sex scenes or anything, but they get showed them in bed together, like, partially naked. I was like, what? So I wasn't ready. <laughs> so I'm so used to K-dramas where you don't kiss until episode six, and that's a scandal. So mm. I was like, oh, okay. But it's a really cute uh, romantic comedy. It kind of reminds me of Eternal Sunshine of a Spotless Mind, for a spoiler alert, in that they forget each other, but they had previously tried to end their marriage or married, and now they've forgotten each other, and they're trying to figure out what they want, and they kind of are like resetting everything. So it's a comedy, but in my mind, I was like, oh, it's not going to end well. <laughs> but who knows? <laughs> who knows? <laughs> we'll see. Uh, but also, yeah, if you have time, watch that. It's a cute, easy watch. Uh, you, I just said that you just recently watched one uh, with the one of the actors from Parasite who did uh, Die by Suicide, I think this year, actually. Um, and that movie was Sleep. Yes. As you probably ascertained, I'm always on the hunt for new horror movies, and uh, this one was pretty well-reviewed, and I wanted to I wanted to check it out. I'm going to tell you, Samantha, a lot of the movies, and a lot of them are international that I've been watching lately that I haven't seen. <laughs> dog dies in them. Oh, um, a dog die, Two animals. dogs die in no. sleep. It's actually kind of, it's played kind of comically, but yes, oh, I get okay. it. Oh, okay. Um, <laughs> yeah. But it's about um, a new... A newly married couple moves in, the The wife is pregnant, and they have this sign that reads something like, together we can do anything. It's like one of those really uh, cheesy, eat, like, yeah, eat, pray, love, yeah. <laughs> but it says something like, together we can do anything. And the husband is an actor, but he starts sleepwalking, and he starts doing, like, in progressively creepier and creepier things while he's sleepwalking. I think the first thing he says is something like, someone's here. But it gets worse. And the whole movie, you're questioning whether or not it is sleepwalking or as the wife starts to believe there is a ghost or something possessing him. Mm. And then the baby, when the baby is born, it becomes like a danger to the baby She's not sleeping. He's not sleeping. Worst decisions. Eventually, she makes a PowerPoint <laughs> about how they're being haunted, uh, which is one of my favorite things. And there is a really sassy, like, uh, I would probably shaman, sort of like an exorcist that comes in who I liked yeah. a lot. Uh, it was really good. I, I, it kept me guessing to the end, to the very end. I was not sure <laughs> what was going on here. <laughs> but it was, it's definitely like a, it, it was an interesting look at a couple 
because she's got this sign and she keeps pointing to it like we can do everything together we can do it and they're just <laughs> like motto. falling apart because neither of them are sleeping and she's afraid he's gonna murder the baby at any moment so it doesn't end well <laughs> i yeah i won't spoil it but it definitely again it takes a turn it takes a turn in the third act. They all I do. Was... They all do. I think they love a good, like, uh, unexpected because it's kind of like the K-dramas that I've talked about. I'm like, oh, this is a cute little romantic comedy. Why did they have to do a murder scene with nothing? Like, it hasn't... Why? And then one of them gets stalked and then they get murdered. I'm like, what just happened? What, what just... What just happened? <laughs> right. Like... <laughs> Why are we killing people now? What's happening? Kidnapping people? Like, this is so, so dark all of a sudden. It just, that seemed unnecessary. <laughs> the Korean movies, Korean shows need to just really love to do that. Um, <laughs> yeah, and then I have another recommendation. I think I've talked about this movie before, and I'd watched this. This was one of those movies that I had watched way back when, and I was like, oh, yeah, because it also has one of those twists and turns that you're never, you never know what's happening. It's called The Witch Part 1, The Subversion. And there is a part two that I haven't seen yet because I was like, it's the original actress in there because she is amazing. And actually, she's um, been in, I think I talked about Our Beloved Summer as being one of my favorite Korean dramas that's just really sweet and unexpected. But The Witch Part 1, The Subversion, this was her first uh, movie, Kim Dami and uh, Che Wushik. He was the main actor in Parasite, as well as Okja, which I have not seen and I will not watch because of the, again, and aforementioned, like, I yeah. will not watch things with animal deaths or abuse or loneliness. This is a plot point in a show I really like called Poker Face, where one of the characters is a barbecue. He, like, had the most famous barbecue in Texas or whatever. He saw that movie and quit his job. <laughs> really? <laughs> yes. I love it. Fair enough. Fair enough. Uh, it, I had that moment uh, yesterday when I watched something with uh, Live Octopus mm. going, but they're so smart. Are you going to kill it? Don't do this. And then I realized, I think I'm really glad that I'm allergic to cephalopods. <laughs> They're very this is hurts smart. my feelings. <laughs> anyway, back to uh, but it, so these two are in the witch part one, the subversion. Uh, the two top actors are in uh, our beloved summer, which I, is one of my favorite K dramas, like uh, all time favorites. Gave me all the feels, and I really felt like they did a great job. But this movie was a huge difference, and she does an amazing job. This is her first movie, from what I gather. I think it may be her first acting job. I'm not really sure about that. But uh, she killed this role, and it has a lot of dark twists and turns. This probably wouldn't be necessarily a horror movie, but it is a thriller, a uh, suspenseful thriller. And I think it's worth a watch. We should talk about this later, but, you know, it's worth a watch for anybody asking. So I'm actually going to cut this short because I, I did not think that we had that much to say about four movies, but I guess we really did, Annie. Also, just the welcome back sequence because we really missed you. Um, we are going to go ahead and end it here, but I will say I'm currently watching Culinary Class Wars, which is on Netflix, not a sponsor. Um, and it's an interesting setup in which it is a cooking show. I love me a good cooking show. I love competitive cooking. I don't know what it is, but that's probably one of my favorite things ever. Top Chef was on my top five, which, which is why Padma Lakshmi is on my please come talk to me. Let me just look at you list. Um, <laughs> she is amazing to me, and I love the shows in general, and they make me really hungry. Really hungry. Anyway, but... With all that, this is a Korean culinary cook show, uh, cooking competition, where they have experienced award-winning chefs who have already made their, a name for themselves. A lot of them have Michelin stars. A lot of them are, like, top-ranked in competitions and all of these things uh, versus newly uh, up-and-coming chefs who are not necessarily making the name for themselves um, at this point in time. They are very, it's very interesting. It's very Korean, but it's an co interesting concept because the idea of class wars within this type of culture, as well as the fact that in South, in South Korea, class is a big conversation and part of, I think, a big controversy within their culture, especially with the newer, newer, younger generations, especially when it comes to the job market, about respect and about who has the right to do what to other people. Because we've talked about this. I'm like, this is so insane how the level of disrespect newer, younger employees or people get by the older generations. And they are told to 
you know, put up with it. That's just the way it is. And it's an odd concept to me because I'm like, in the U.S., if you kick your employee or if you pretend like you're going to hit an employee, you're going to get sued. Like, rightly so. So this is an odd thing. I don't, again, I'm not sure if this is dramatized and it happens as often as it does, but we know that the belittling and then like the put down of, whether it's emotionally or just like verbally, it happens a lot. It's kind of, to me, an unsettling cultural aspect of that, of a lot of Asian cultures. Of course, we know that also there's a flip, which like the younger generations are way too comfortable and disrespectful. So there's got to be a line. But all that to say, this kind of pulls it out in a culinary level. Like, I was screaming at the TV, Annie. My partner <laughs> came down because I was like, you're so mean. Why are you being so mean? Like, <laughs> it just felt rude. Um, and shout out Edward Lee, who is a Korean-American uh, cook uh, who has won many awards, was on Top Chef. That's actually how I got to know him. Apparently won Iron Chef in the U.S., uh, as well as uh, did, like, the House White House State Dinner for South Korea uh, leader and the American uh, president at the time, so it was really cool. So he's a really big deal, and he went to South Korea to compete, and him very, knowing very minimal Korean and competing with this type of uh, culinary expertise in, in Korea using their, their, like, ingredients and all of their types of taste when it comes to culinary taste, because it's different. It's, it was interesting to see. I felt very seen with him trying to figure things out, knowing very minimal Korean, growing up Korean. I was like, okay, yeah. I feel I like, it felt <laughs> like one of those moments of like, I can relate so well to this, and I didn't think I could to anyone who had actual like Korean upbringing. But anyway, all that to say is, of course, we're rooting. I was rooting for him. I think it is over. I got spoiled on it today. Yeah. I know. I didn't know. I didn't know they were going to spoil me. But it's okay. I'm slowly making it through. But a shout out. If you like culinary sh shows, if you like competitive like cooking shows like I do, you should definitely check this out. I think it's really interesting, especially the types of food that they make. It makes you really hungry. <laughs> <laughs> oh, no. I know. I get tense just thinking about it. It, uh. it is intense. Like, I'm like... <laughs> I want everyone to win. I know. Unless you're sad. a jerk, then I want you to lose. Right. And there's not really any jerks in there. And then there's people who are like older people who are coming on that have never. I'm like, she yeah. got disqualified. Ajima, I'm sorry. Oh, no. Samantha's getting emotional. I was getting emotional and yelling at the screen. It's fine. I'm fine. I get it. I get it. <laughs> um. Well, yes, we'll have to come back. Touch base again. Because we didn't get through this whole whole outline. Um, but in the meantime, uh, listeners, if you have any thoughts about any of this, if you have any suggestions, any things we should check out, mm -hmm. uh, please let us know. Our email is stuffmediamomstuff at iheartmedia.com. You can find us on Twitter at Momstuff Podcast or on Instagram and TikTok at Stuff I've Never Told You. We have a tea public store and we have a book you can get wherever you get your books. Thanks as always to our super producer, Christina, our executive producer, Maya, and our contributor, Joey. Thank you. And thanks to you for listening. Stuff I've Never Told You is a production of iHeartRadio. For more podcasts from iHeartRadio, you can check out the iHeartRadio app, Apple Podcasts, or wherever you listen to your favorite shows. 